They call growth hormone the hormone of youth, but it truly is a double-edged sword. Too high and you can deplete your stem cell pool and increase the risk of cancer, but too low can drive frailty with age and even inflammation if you're training hard. So everyone has their own individual optimal marker of it, which is IGF-1, which is downstream of it. So I'll get onto that with my own personal measurements doing it. But first I'm gonna talk about three different secretagogues and their unique potential benefits. So you've got ipamorelin, CJC1295, and this is without DAC, and then tesamorelin. And I've used those first two, so I'll give you my verdict on them. But let's go over all the mechanisms of action and their pros and cons. So you've got ipamorelin, which is a growth hormone releasing peptide. So it works off the ghrelin receptor. But unlike things uh, like MK677, which also works off the ghrelin receptor, that can actually increase cortisol and hunger. But with ipamorelin, it doesn't seem to do that. But then ipamorelin has a much shorter half-life at two to four hours make it less anabolic, but more pro-longevity. Then we've got CJC1295 without DAC, and this version of it has a longer half-life at four to eight hours. And I'll get onto this with my own personal findings with it. So it's a growth hormone releasing hormone receptor agonist. So what this is doing is stimulating your pituitary to spit out more growth hormone. So it's working off your own natural pathways, unlike with actually taking exogenous growth hormone. And then you've got uh, tesamorelin, which that one has an even longer half-life, just a little bit longer at eight to 10 hours. But unlike with CJC, which is a GHRH receptor agonist, this is actually a GHRH analog. So what that means is less enzymatic breakdown, in particular CD26, which breaks down peptides. So this translates into a larger GH pulse for longer, meaning a more sustained IGF-1 response. And because of these higher, more selective GH peaks, this is why tesamorelin is known to be particularly potent for reducing uh, visceral adipose tissue. In a study back in 2011 with HIV patients, over six months, they were able to reduce that visceral fat by between 15 and 20%, and that's why it's been FDA approved. And you may be thinking that sustained IGF-1 response is detrimental to lifespan, and yeah, you're, you're right. But that's where with tesamorelin, I believe as a short term thing to break down that adipose tissue, it's a great agent because what's the other option? Having another few more decades of having that around your organs or breaking it down over a period of time. And then you can uh, you know, review things, maybe switch to a more mild secretagogue if needed like ipamorelin. So that's the difference between them. Remember ipamorelin, it's a growth hormone releasing peptide, so it's a pulse uh, amplifier, whereas both CJC1295 and tesamorelin, think of them as pulse initiators through that pituitary gland. And due to the longer half-life of tesamorelin, a lot of people choose to dose it every other day at two milligrams, whereas other people like to spread it out doing it, say, five days a week at a dose of one milligram. With the rise of the term azempic face, which can be described as a hollowing out of the cheeks and drooping of the skin, I can see a link with low IGF-1. As a study back in 2008 saw that long-term calorie restriction lowered circulating levels of IGF-1 unless the protein intake was high. In particular, foods rich in the amino acid leucine. So I think IGF-1 should be a biomarker that's tracked when people on weight loss injections because it's crucial for collagen production, elastin maintenance, as well as just maintaining skin thickness. Fortunately for me, during the time where my IGF-1 has been below age expected, I've been using peptide serums like uh, GHKCU, which massively boost collagen production. So moving on to my cycles of growth hormone secretagogues, it's been quite some time since I've done them. It was late 2022. And then measuring my IGF-1 levels, and this is through my hormone age. So my this measures both IGF-1 and DHEA, and DHEA has been stable, but IGF-1 has been steadily going down. That means my hormone age is going up. And then as of the summer last year, when I'm actually measured IDF1, it was coming in at 19.6, which translates into 150 nanograms. So right in the optimal point of longevity, but since that point up until February, it's got it appears to have got lower still because my hormone age has gone up. And so yeah, that, that's why I mentioned about everyone has their Goldilocks zone to be at where you get good response, especially if you're an athlete, if you're training hard, then 
It can drive up inflammation if you're not recovering well. Check out our 12 month rejuvenation program where every three months we look at 225 different biomarkers and get your future vitality optimized. There's even a six month break clause if your situation was to change. And of course, IGF-1 levels downregulate with age, so that needs to be factored in as well. But over this eight week cycle, first of all, of using ipamorelin, so the more mild out of these secretagogues, so far, yeah, what I've seen with it, it's been great for initiating sleep. As that short but false acting GH pulse improved my sleep latency. And looking over the whole eight weeks, every single time, apart from one night, I do it only on Wednesdays and Thursday nights because I train Monday to Friday. So my delayed onset muscle soreness is building up during that week. And then, so those are the two nights that my muscles need that extra recovery and consistently my uh, restorative sleep has been highest now. It used to be my worst nights of the week and now it's been the highest, apart from one night out of those whole eight weeks. I also increased my lean muscle mass by around one kilo. That's partly down to the peptide TB500, which also supports recovery, angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels. That was right, that was the earlier point of my hypomorelin cycle and then I went straight from that to using CJC1295, of course, without DAC. And that, uh, so far, it's early days, but the first week I did it, my restorative sleep was through the roof. And then also I noticed my recovery, like in those workouts, I was able to train that bit harder. And then I had a week off because I had a five day weekend. So I was only training the last couple of days that week. And so I didn't, there's no point doing the CJC for that week in between and then I got back to it the following week and then interestingly my restorative sleep wasn't amazing on those two nights um, but then I did notice my training was actually quite good so I'm, I'm thinking that there seems to be more of an anabolic effect just like the IGF-1 being a more sustained release and then interestingly on that final day of the week on the Friday I actually managed to set like uh, my I measure my cardio output over 20 minutes in a steady state environment reading the news the the subtitles on that news and then I'm able to uh, yeah measure how many calories I can burn over that period of time and on that Friday I was 2% off my absolute peak which is not bad because that's like right at the end of the week and then over that weekend, I had the whole the rest of the day off, and I you, I actually kind of forgot that I'd done an intense uh, workout session. Went off to a festival, and there's lots and lots of hills and so much walking, setting up tents, driving three hours, all these things. And then I actually had an amazing recovery that Friday night. Normally, if I've been training quite hard, it, my recovery won't really restore the score. That won't really restore till Saturday or and sunday so that's quite interesting recovery scores a combination of your you know sleep your restorative sleep as well as things like your heart rate variability resting heart rate which is a sign of physiological stress as well as emotional stress and then so that is very very interesting that i had a good recovery score on that friday because like i say it was a lot of physiological stress during that day the amount of walking i did especially now I've realized that wearing like heavy solid shoes it does make a difference especially when you're doing lots of uphill and downhill walking it does make a difference for your legs like how much energy you're burning so in hindsight I probably would wear my like more sporty type shoes to these kind of festivals so I'll continue my cycle of CJC giving you updates at the moment I've been running 150 micrograms so as, as the same with Ipamorelin just doing it on the Wednesday and Thursday night because I, I do uh, the mTOR inhibitor rapamycin which is a potent mTOR inhibitor actually so you don't want to be running them at the exact same time so I'm letting my IGF-1 levels start to normalize before I do something like rapamycin which is known to uh, lower IGF-1 and then back on to ipamorelin so i do that again like i mentioned on the wednesday and thursday night and then i do a higher dose at 250 micrograms it's a little bit weaker than cjc and over that time because the ipamorelin that vial five milligram vial will last exactly the that eight weeks with that cjc i got again a five milligram vial but it won't last it, it, because I don't want to reconstitute it and leave it more than 10 weeks there would be some wastage so on that final night that I mentioned 
just recently where I had a particularly good response the following night after doing having a really intense day there's a lot of loud music which would have in theory that would have drove down my heart rate variability because I could hear that music even when I was trying to sleep I had to sleep with ear defenders on even and on, a, on an uncomfortable bed all these things would make a difference but I still had a 95 percent uh, recovery and my heart rate variability is like the best I've ever seen it like it's in the 170s and the following day even went up to 180 interestingly we're well, just over 180 so this is this is good signs that I'm recovering well but one interesting change I did with CJC on that most recent night I mentioned was rather than do the 150 micrograms I increased it up to uh, 225 so the way I dilute it would be instead of doing six units I went up to nine and so that could be a possible reason why I had such a good response that following day, a really good workout, trained hard despite going five days up until that point. But then of course that GHRH receptor becomes desensitized when you start going much above one microgram per kilogram of body weight. So uh, there's, no, there's no need to really go high with these things. So uh, I think in future I may find a middle ground. You've got to remember with these GH secretor gogs, especially when they're done individually, you're only expecting a what a 20 to 40% increase in growth hormone. So if you're already like fairly low anyway, it's no way near anywhere super physiological. And, and it's only for a short period of time as well. That, that's where some of these longevity experts, they talk about mTOR inhibition, and you know, that is pro-longevity inhibiting it, but just doing that all year round, seven days a week, then I think there is a negative aspect to that as well. It depends on the lifestyle you're leading to. If you're a little old lady living in Sardinia, just walking around, you know, doing very low level activity, then you can probably get away with your IGF-1 levels being in that, say, just over 100, 120, that region, and you feel fine. Whereas if you're a really highly strong athlete, that same level, you're probably going to get a lot of delayed onset muscle soreness. For me, because I have such a busy work schedule that my cortisol tends to creep up during the week and then that inevitably would drive up the rate-limiting hormone somatostatin, which lowers uh, your growth hormone. So I get my ipomorin. I got that from Peptides of London, really high-end peptides, clinical grade. They even supplied a top university, uh, Brunel, with Epitalon and a groundbreaking new study. And then uh, they they also uh, the CJC that again is from Peptides of London. Uh, another company I use is Swiss Chems. They've they've got all these things, both CJC twelve nine five, ipomorlin, and tesamorlin. Again, very good value for money. I even did my own independent testing on their epitalon, and that came back as legit. And both of these two companies have a good price point on their peptides, especially in the case of these two, ipomorlin and CJC. I think they're one of the best bang for buck peptides out there. So if you like that video, then check out this one on TB500, that peptide I mentioned earlier that stimulates angiogenesis, but it just has so many different applications throughout your body. Thanks for watching. See you next time.